listen to or how much, a little we listen to, but who do we listen to? Uh, who are we uh, a pupil of? Who is our teacher? Tonight, we're talking about metaphorical differences as we go throughout this uh, metaf metaphorical impacts, I guess you could say, uh, and uh, different ways that we can see in the Bible that we uh, see metaphors of how we can make an impact for the Lord Jesus Christ. And tonight, we're specifically talking about a disciple. A uh, disciple is just simply a pupil, one who learns from another's teachings. And as Christians, we all ought to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have an important uh, relationship with the master teacher, and we ought to always be learning uh, as we grow in our Christian life. In fact, I would even go as far as to say, if you're not learning, you're not growing, because we all constantly have to be absorbing what's in the Word of God. Uh, <clears throat> the word disciple simply means learner or pupil. In this message, I want to look at the relationship between the master teacher, the Lord Jesus Christ, and us as his pupils. Now, let's start reading in John chapter 8. We'll just read one verse to start out with. And then we're going to go a couple of pages over. John chapter 8, verse number 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which listened, or which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. The same could be said to everyone in this room tonight. Now turn over a few pages to John chapter 13, 35. Well-known verse, I use it all the time. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now, a lot of churches, I, I grew up in some really strict churches and in uh, Christian school and, and whatnot. And, you know, we had, I, I grew up in a church that strongly preached against any woman wearing slacks and, and uh, strongly preached against a lot of things. And, and, uh, and, which, by the way, I'm all, I'm all for any kind of those standards. That's a blessing. Uh, but the, uh, the interesting thing is a lot of churches in my experience have added something different to the last part of that verse. By this shall all men know you're my disciples if you dress this way or if you act this way or if you don't listen to that or if you look like this. That's not what Jesus said. He said, if you have love for one another. And that's really the most important thing for us. We want to be his disciples, and tonight we're going to talk about that, about being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ and some of the things that are involved in it. We ask you, Father, to help us tonight as we look at this uh, and other texts. May we be uh, found in the end here a faithful disciple of you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The, in the story about Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, we find that his sisters, Lazarus' sisters, demonstrated two different types of disciples. Uh, they both loved Jesus. They both uh, loved to be around him. They both thought the world of him. They were dear friends of Jesus. But they reacted to him in a different way. You remember Martha was bustling around, preparing and working. She was the worker bee. And then you had Mary that was sitting at the feet of Jesus, ah, just listening. Uh, there's a place for both. If you want somebody to be your wedding organizer, you're not going to pick Mary. You're going to pick Martha. If you want uh, somebody to listen to you talk about your problems or you want to pour your heart out, some, you'll probably pick Mary, not Martha. You know what I'm saying? So there's a place for both. But Mary complained about Mary's lack of, or Martha complained about Mary's lack of service, and Jesus gently rebuked her. He said in Luke 10, 41, and Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. To take time to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to his teaching, to take time to listen to his preaching and teaching through the Word of God even, that is the attitude of a disciple. We ought to all have that attitude. Jesus invites us all in Matthew 11, come unto me and learn of me, he said. The invitation is open, and we need to respond to that call. The Lord is eager to teach, and we ought to be eager to learn. Now, I'm going to ask you tonight, as far as we, we're using the word disciple, but remember we're talking about disciple really means student. So are you a student? Are you learning? Are you continuing in your spiritual education? And that happens through the Word of God, 
uh, your schooling, which I guess we could equate to coming to the local church and getting, uh, you know, Sunday school, Sunday morning preaching, Sunday night. I, I was just talking to someone last week who was talking about the, the differences in our services. And, and I, I think that's important. That's why I'm a strong believer in three to thrive. If you really want to thrive in your Christian life, you'll, you'll make all three services. You'll make every attempt to make three because they're different in their scope. On Sunday morning, I always call that the marshmallow message. All right. We have, uh, it's a little bit, lighter as far as that goes and and uh it, it, because it's you have visitors you have unchurched people that come in we don't use quite as many churchy terms uh, in the preaching on sunday morning uh you'll notice usually i don't add, use the word term saved much on sunday morning in the messages because to a lost person what does it mean to be saved saved from what you know i was saved from drowning when i was seven does that count uh we don't that's a church term that we understand and so uh we call it being you know, being a Christian, calling on Christ to be our Savior, try to define some of those terms. But then Sunday night's a little bit different. We get a little bit uh, deeper in some of the teaching. We uh, are more local church oriented on Sunday night. And then on Wednesday night, we constantly do a character study, and that's where we dig uh, pretty deep in the scriptures there. So uh, I encourage you to be a part of all as uh, I know I'm preaching to the choir because you're here. Amen. So that's a good thing. But uh, I'm simply saying we ought to be students. We ought to be students. Now, number one that I want to talk about tonight, the disciple is called. A disciple is called. Jesus had many disciples, but he had 12 that he specifically called and specifically chose to teach on a more intimate level. Now, I want to think about Jesus' ministry. When Jesus fed the 5,000 we know it was 5,000 men in their families, so it's probably more like fifteen to 20,000, but we'll use the term, the, when Jesus fed the 5,000, only 500 followed him after lunch. Did you ever read that in your Bible? And then he had only 12 disciples that followed him uh, a long time after that. Only three went with him into the garden, and only one stood with him at the cross. Now, the implication there is clear. The closer you get to the cross the smaller your crowd becomes. The more difficult Christianity becomes. It trims out the crowd. I was doing some reading recently about what has hurt the church in the 21st century and 20th century, 21st century. And uh, I, one man made a statement that I really thought a lot about. And he said, popularity has done much more to hurt Jesus Christ's church than persecution ever did. Persecution made the church thrive. It purified it. It expanded it. And the church did wonderful under persecution. Popularity, though, pollutes the church. And it's an interesting concept. That's not an area I was going to go into tonight, but that's a great thing to think about. But we are called. Now, the calling of the twelve, uh, even though we see that, that uh, as Jesus got closer to the cross, his crowd diminished, we are called to be disciples through thick and thin. And we talked this morning about Peter, and we'll talk about him tonight again a little bit, uh, how he failed when the going got tough. Now, twelve, uh, the, the calling of the twelve applies to us, and it really has two parts involved in it. Number one, to be with him. Turn to Matthew chapter 4. I'm going to have you turn to several scriptures tonight. <clears throat> if you don't have your Bible with you, just listen as I read. But if you do, it would be great to have you turn with me. Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 18. And Jesus, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. Answering the call to be a disciple, uh, that means they witnessed firsthand his miracles. They witnessed his meeting the needs of those that no one else could help. They saw him heal the sick and afflicted. They saw him feed the multitudes, calm the raging sea, restore the dead to life. They heard his words of wisdom, and they heard his words of rebuke, and they heard his words of comfort. In those days, the disciples stayed with Jesus, went with him wherever he went. The Lord, through the person of the Holy Spirit, indwells the Christian and is present with us as well, like Jesus was with his disciples. And he's present with us all the time. Wherever you go, if you're a Christian, if you're a child of God, if you called on him to be your savior, wherever you go, he goes, he indwells you. Let me read you a couple of verses, Romans eight, and nine, but you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. That verse flies in the face 
of the teaching that the, the false teaching of the charismatics who say you get saved and then later you receive the Holy Spirit. No, the Bible says if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not a Christian. If you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Going on here, verse 11, But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Over and over there, he said, dwells in you. The Holy Spirit indwells every person who has trusted Christ as their Savior. He is always with us, and he desires that we be aware of his presence. And uh, we're called to be with him, and we're blessed to have uh, to know that he's always with us. Yet sometimes we try to compartmentalize our life and keep the Lord out of some areas, don't we, if we're honest? But we need to be conscious, constantly conscious of his presence in our lives. Uh, we're not going to go into an in-depth uh, study of the Holy Spirit, but you know the Holy Spirit is called the comforter. He's called the teacher. Uh, he convicts uh, the Holy Spirit comforts or afflicts the comfortable and comforts the afflicted. The uh, Holy Spirit has lots of ministries in our life, and so uh, he is our constant companion. Now, many Old Testament examples uh, are given of people living in the presence of the Lord. The Bible says in Genesis 5 that Enoch walked with God. In Genesis 6, it says that Noah walked with God. And uh, we see Old Testament kings who had the power of God on their life. Living in the presence of the Lord means that sometimes... Hardships will come. Uh, being a Christian does not exempt us from hardships. In fact, sometimes we have hardships brought into our lives to help us shape and form us into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Uh, All things work together to those that love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. And then he goes on the next verse, the purpose for those things in our life that work out for good are that He might form us into the image of His Son. Jesus said, In Matthew 26, where we read about the Last Supper there, we'll be talking about that next Sunday morning. But he said, Verily I say unto you, one of you shall betray me. All of the disciples, oh, no, not me. We won't betray you. Well, at that point, they were asking, who is it? Is it me? They didn't know who it was. They wanted to be faithful to him. We have the same desire as well. Now, the question for you is, do we uh, intend to stay faithful when the going gets rough? I think all of us intend to. But what really is the testing point? What is uh, We talked about this in discipleship tonight a little bit. What is the deciding factor whether you'd die for the Lord? Have you ever thought about that? What if it comes down? You've read, uh, have you ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs? Whew, you can't read much of that. It'll upset your stomach. Horrible. Uh, the people that in, in history that have died for the faith. Well, I've, I've asked myself that before. Would I... It came down to, what if guys showed up with guns one night and, uh, you know, renounced faith or be, be shot in the face? Would we die for Christ? Well, thankfully, we're not called to die for him. We're called to live for him. <laughs> and that really is your test right there. If you're not living for him, I can promise you, friend, you won't die for him. And so that's something we ought to remember there. Uh, I'll be faithful. That's easy to say when life's going well, isn't it? Peter said it in the safety of all the other disciples and Jesus there, he said, hey, I'll never forsake you, Lord. Hours later, he was denying Jesus three times. It's easy to say in the comfort of where we're at, but what happens when life gets difficult? As one preacher said, a faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. In the lives of the disciples, that test was about to come. Let's turn to Matthew 26, if you would. Matthew 26. In uh, This is the Garden of Gethsemane here. <coughs> Jesus asked his disciples to wait while he went to pray. And uh, all alone, he poured out his soul to his father in prayer. In Matthew 26, verse 39, he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let, <coughs> let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. He returned from praying, not once, but two times to find his disciples asleep. For what it's worth, I don't know if you knew this or not, but did you know you burn around 70 calories an hour while you sleep? If you you sleep eight hours, you burn roughly the same amount of calories that you get from a five-mile run. Isn't that good? Next time... 
somebody finds you sleeping, you tell them, I'm not sleeping, I'm exercising, amen? That's a good thing to know. But there are some times we should not sleep, and this was one of them. I know they were tired. Jesus at his lowest points and says, can you not just pray with me for an hour? And they fell asleep. Oh, it can be so applicable to our life. How many times when we ought to be busy about the business of what the Lord wants us to do and he finds us asleep? Those same men couldn't fulfill the simple request to watch and pray. I think it's such a blessing what Jesus said, though. He understood their fleshly weaknesses, and he understood their tiredness. He said, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. What a gracious thing for the Lord to say when he finds him sleeping the second time. He just says, sleep on. I love the fact that Jesus understood their tiredness, and he didn't uh, get all upset about it. Soon the soldiers came, led by Judas. They came to arrest Jesus. Now, now is the time for the disciples to show their resolution. They had said they're going to stand with him. They had promised they would never fail him. But look what it says in verse number 56 of Matthew chapter 26. All this was done that the scriptures of the prophets should be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Friends, it's easy for us in church tonight to sit here in the comfort of our chairs and our temperature-controlled building and say, hey, I'll go all the way for Christ. It's a lot different when we get out into the battlefield, isn't it? And we ought to pray. If we're going to be true students, true disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to have to uh, pray that his power would be upon us. Uh, the sad story continues. In verse 58, Peter followed him afar off. He did follow Jesus, but he followed him at a safe distance. This also could describe so many Christians today. They only follow Jesus to a point. They always stay a safe distance back. They don't want to get too carried away. They don't want to become fanatical. They don't want to get too involved in the church. I asked a man recently about, uh, I don't know what we we're talking about, just serving in the church. He says, oh, no, I learned a long time ago. You don't ever start doing stuff in church. They'll expect it all the time. Uh, yeah, there's some truth to that. But we ought to look for places to serve, amen? Uh, not look for it to avoid it. But uh, so here it was, Peter, he finds himself away from the presence of God. He finds himself at a place of decision. Look at verse 39, uh, 69, I'm sorry. This is still in Matthew 26. Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also wast with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And he was going out into the porch. Another maid saw him and said unto him, uh, Them that were near, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again he denied with an oath and said, I do not know the man. And after a while they came unto him and they, that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thy speech bereath thee. And he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. This is Peter. This is Peter. Ready to die for Jesus just a chapter before. Oh, no, I'll never forsake you, Lord. What a sad thing. Uh, it he found himself at a place of decision, and he was, had separated himself from God. He was, too, he was a distance from him. Peter's denial actually began when he left the presence of Jesus, because apart from the Lord, under the pressure of hostile surroundings, he denied Jesus, and he denied him the second time with an oath, and the third time he cursed and swore to do it. When we distance ourselves from the Lord, there's no telling how low we'll go. I, I, I counsel people all the time, not in church, don't ever darken the door, all kinds of problems in their life, don't understand why. And to me, the answer is very simple. You're trying to live life. It's like those uh, power strips. If, if you plug the main cord into itself, you got no power, okay? You got to plug it into the wall, amen? Even blondes know that, right? Amen? So, uh, but you, you're not going to get any power plug. And people try to live plugged into themselves. They can't figure out why there's no power there. You've got to get yourself close to the Lord. Be faithful to church. Be involved in those things. Uh, be around God's people. Distancing ourselves from God's presence has an effect on our reputation as well. Let me give you another one here. Remember the disciple we call Doubting Thomas? I talked to him about it this morning a little bit. He wasn't with the other disciples when Jesus appeared to them. And when was it? When was it, class? It was a Sunday night. Huh? It's important to come to church Sunday night, isn't it? And that's when Jesus showed up. And so... Yeah, he said in John 20, 25, uh, the disciples said, We've seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands a print of the nails, and put my finger in the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Jesus later revealed himself to Thomas, but 
Thomas certainly missed a blessing because he wasn't there the first time. As a result, his reputation has been set for all time. There's even a song, Doubting Thomas, why could you not believe? I don't know how the words go. There's songs been made about it, messages have been preached about Doubting Thomas. I, I, as I said this morning, I think it's an unfair title. I think he was a lot more than just that one. Uh, but uh, the, So it was an unfair reputation. But can I ask you, when has a reputation ever been fair? A lot of times reputations are unfair. And so uh, it, it's unfortunate. He just missed church one time. And it's, as a disciple of Jesus, it's important for us to be present with him. And then secondly, to be like him. In Luke 6, 40, the disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be his, as his master. In this sense, the word perfect means complete, one that is what he ought to be. The disciple is one who's continually becoming more like his master. One of the great blessings of being a Christian is that we get the divine nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. We get, as, as being a child of God, we get his nature. That's a blessing, isn't it? Uh, you've seen yourself as you get older, you see your father in you. I, I've talked to people who never met their father, either died young or left when they were very young. And they, they hear all the time, man, you look just like your dad or you talk just like your dad, even though they've never met him. Why? Because they inherited his nature. We've also inherited a divine nature. We ought to be like our heavenly father. The disciples of Jesus were like him. They were like Jesus. They acted like him. That's why they said in verse 73, thy speech bereath thee. The word bereath there is, is, means clear, evident, manifest. It means the way you talk. You talk just like he does. We think you're one of his. It's obvious to them that Peter was a disciple. How tragic then that Peter would swear and curse to prove he didn't even know Jesus. When people hear us talk, when they observe our life, do they see Christ? We ought to reflect Christ in our life. Romans chapter 8, verse 29, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. We are to be conformed, or another way of saying that, copied from the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're a high-quality copy which cannot be distinguished from the original. That's what we ought to be. We ought to represent him. 1 Corinthians 15, 49, as we have borne the image of the earthly, we also should bear the image of the heavenly. We ought to reflect the Lord Jesus Christ. The disciple of Jesus is to, is to be like him. So that's the first one. A disciple is called. Secondly, here's the fun part. A disciple is criticized. Personal criticism. Who likes it? <laughs> I don't. Nobody likes criticism. Uh, even Jesus... <coughs> The perfect Son of God was severely criticized while he was on earth. Everything he did ticked off the Pharisees. Everything he did made them mad. They didn't like his healing people on the Sabbath. They didn't like his eating with publicans and sinners. They didn't like his claiming, I and my Father are one, John chapter 10. They didn't like the fact that he didn't wash it ceremonially before his meals. A critical, critical, critical spirit, on and on. The Finnish composer Gene Silvius said this, Remember, there is no city in the world where they have erected a statue to a critic. <laughs> the, nobody likes a critic, amen? And yet so many people feel called by God to be a critic, and they criticize everything. Jesus taught us, though, to expect criticism <coughs> for the sake of being his disciples. He even taught us to appreciate criticism as an honor of sorts. <coughs> Matthew 5.11 Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and she'll say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For they, so they persecuted the prophets which were before you. Don't only expect it. But when you get it, don't let it discourage you. We're going to see criticism corporately. By choosing to be a disciple of, a disciple of Christ, you align yourself with an often criticized group. You ever notice that a little religion is okay with the world? Even the most wicked politicians will claim to be religious a little bit. They'll align themselves with a church. Or they'll, they'll go, like presidential candidates will visit a church here and there. Uh, so a little church affiliation is okay. But if you be a person who genuinely believes the Bible, who attends church, who practices tithing, who prays and expects God to answer those prayers, one who witnesses to others and lives the way Jesus wants you to live, you're an extremist. You're a wacko. You're two fries short of a Happy Meal. You know what I'm saying? That's the way the world looks at you. Just listen to 
CNN or don't. You get more of a blessing if you don't. But listen to what the world has to say about Christians today. We see in the book of Acts the persecutions against the early church. Mostly early Christians were persecuted simply because they were members of that group. Acts 8.1, at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad. And we can relate to that concept. People who tend to judge individuals because of the, uh, and end up stereotyping the groups they belong to. Now, we're going to be criticized. Disciples of Christ ought not be too concerned about their accusations that are leveled at them. We're to be of the world, uh, I'm sorry, we're to be in the world, but not of the world, John 17, 15. And so, criticism is going to happen, not only corporately, but individually too. We're going to be, anytime somebody decides to do something for God, especially if they sell out to God, they're going to be criticized. We have this promise in 2 Timothy 3.12. Yea, and all that live godly shall suffer persecution. It's going to happen. It's a part of it. Living for Jesus will cause you to be criticized, marginalized. There's going to be times that that persecution is personal. You remember Stephen? He was the first Christian martyr in the book of Acts, accused of being a blasphemer. Paul was pointed out individually as a troublemaker. Jason, a man who took Paul in and cared for him, was persecuted because he just cared for Paul and had compassion on him. Naturally, in our life, we'd rather not be criticized. Amen? We don't don't like to be criticized. I, I like everybody to like me. But here's a a piece of advice I saw recently, and I wrote it down. Don't let compliments go to your head, and don't let criticism go to your heart. That's a good thing for both of us, too, isn't it? Sometimes we allow compliments to make our heads big. Uh, we oughtn't let that happen, or criticism go to our heart. Uh, we, allow, we allow these things uh, to wound us sometimes, and even, even when we realize that criticism is for Christ's sake. I uh, saw a Peanuts cartoon one time Linus is curled up and reading a book in a chair. Lucy comes up behind him. Lucy, she's a nasty person. Comes up behind him with a funny look in her face, and she says, it's strange. It happens every time I just look at you. He says, what happens? She answers, I feel a criticism coming on. <laughs> you ever felt that way about somebody or knowing somebody like that? They just look at you, and they feel a criticism coming on. Well, if criticism comes from the world, understand, we're not seeking friendship with the world anyway. The Bible says in James 4, 4, by the way, James, I marvel when I read this verse because I think, man, this guy didn't pull any punches when he preached. He says, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Be prepared for a world to murmur against you especially if you insist on being a disciple of Christ. Luke chapter 5, verse 30, But the scribes and the Pharisees murmured against the disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? Listen, a critic is a nobody doing nothing, criticizing a somebody doing something. Don't let it stop you. It's going to happen in our life. Uh, Not only does the world sometimes persecute Christians, but other believers do the same thing. In fact, in my experience, I don't know about you, but I've sometimes gotten more criticism from other believers than I have people in the world. Acts 13.45 gives an example of this. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy, the, the religious people. They spoke against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming, losing their followers to Paul. Then they went after him verbally, criticizing him. There's a Chinese proverb that I like. Let the man who says it cannot be done not disturb the man doing it. (laughs) Because you're gonna, if you're the man doing it, if you get busy for God, you're gonna be criticized from time to time. Just be faithful. John Wesley, I love this story. John Wesley was that great English preacher uh, in the 1700s, and he was known to be a spiffy dresser. And uh, one Sunday he wore a bow tie that had long ribbons hanging down off of it. And after the sermon, and he was standing in the back, and a lady walked up to him and said, Brother Wesley, are you open to criticism? And she, he said, I guess so. What would you like to criticize? She said, the ribbons on your tie are entirely too long, and they're inappropriate for a man of God. She huffed. Then she took out a pair of scissors and 
snipped them off right there in front of her. True story. So obviously people around her, hush kind of falls over. Remember, it's kind of surprised that somebody would do this to the great John Wesley. And, and in that hush, Wesley calmly said, may I borrow the scissors for a moment? And she handed them to him and he said, now, ma'am, are you open to criticism? She answered and said, well, I suppose I am. He said, all right then, please stick out your tongue. Uh, we're going <laughs> to... He didn't cut off her tongue. It's just an illustration, okay? But he made his point. Uh, no, none of us like criticism. Amen? And uh, we all like to rather go without it, but just be a disciple. Just be faithful. Just continue being a student. Just do what God's called you to do. And be uh, some, there's a lot of times we just have to let that criticism fall off our back. Winston Churchill had an Abraham Lincoln quote framed in his office, and this is what it says. I do the very best I can. I mean to keep going. If the end brings me out all right, then what is said against me won't matter. If I'm wrong, ten angels swearing I was right won't make a difference. Just serve God. Just bloom where you're planted. Just do what he's called you to do. And uh, follow your master teacher. Don't get sidetracked and things will work out better. So a disciple is called. A disciple is criticized. And then finally, a disciple is commissioned. God has commissioned his disciples some specific tasks. Number one is to learn. Now, think of the opportunity the disciples had, the 12 disciples had, as they followed Christ and learned from him on a daily basis. He explained things to them. Oh, it must have been amazing to travel with Jesus and to hear him. Uh, he, he, he especially shared things with them that he didn't share with the multitudes. Many times Jesus spoke in parables to the multitudes and, and the Jewish leaders. Then when he was alone with his disciples, he would, he would explain what they meant to his disciples so that they would gain an understanding. In Mark chapter 4, verse 33 and 4, And with many such parables spake he the word unto them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable spake he not unto them. And when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. Uh, disciples. Now, Matthew 13, 16 tells us why he did that, why he spoke in parables to the crowds <coughs> and gave these truths to his disciples that he didn't share with others. And this is why he said, but blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. If we're open, if we come to the Bible, if we come to church with an open heart, with a seeking heart, uh, he will gladly teach us from the word of God. I had a call the other day, and uh, this is the second time I've had this pretty much exact same call, which leads me to think it's probably the same person. But uh, a guy called and says, uh, asked to speak to the pastor. I told him, I introduced myself, and uh, he started, he said, now I, I uh, just have a question for you today that I'd like to clarify. And he says, on your website, uh, you say that, uh, that G you call Jesus God, you say that he's the son of God and God himself, and and uh, then, he start, then he started in. I mean, just started laying into me about Jesus is not the Son of God. He's, he's, uh, not, he's not God. He's the Son of God. And you can't be God and the Son at the same time. He just started going. It was just, uh, you know, I worked words edgewise and tried to work that stuff in. Try, and every time it was just hot, chop, chop. He came very well prepared to be argued. I, I'm not appreciative of arguers. I don't know. I'm, I don't like arguments. It just means, you know, if a guy's a seeker, it's one thing. Uh, so eventually... I uh, hung up on him because he was not looking. He was just looking to start a fight, and uh, he was out of state anyway. And so I, I uh, don't didn't take much time with that. But that's not how we ought to approach the Bible. Amen. Approach the Bible to learn. Approach the Bible to with an open heart. Don't approach it with a cold heart, uh, a closed heart. I could have said anything in the world that wouldn't have convinced him because he didn't have an open heart. Many people do not. We need to come to the Bible with an open heart. In Matthew 24, the disciples specifically asked for the meaning behind the prophecies, and Jesus taught that to them. They were seekers. Uh, the Lord never turns away those that want to learn. The disciples were his pupils, and we are called to be his pupils. And their main duty in those three short years of ministry was to learn, to listen uh, to what Jesus had to say. Before Jesus ascended back to his father, <coughs> he made sure to tell his disciples, hey, the learning's not over. I'm going to send you a teacher. That's why he said in John 14, 26, but the comforter, which is called the Holy Ghost, whom the father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. And guess what he's doing? He's still teaching today. Amen? We're still learning. 
uh, bringing all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. The learning process of the disciples never ended, and it shouldn't ever end with us either. All of us should be lifelong learners. I think it's interesting in 2 Timothy 4. I mean, it was just probably days before Paul's death. He writes Timothy, and when he writes him, he says, bring the parchments and the books. Uh, He was still learning. He was still reading, and he never stopped until the very last day. He was on death row, and he still felt he should study and learn. And then to tell the disciples of Christ had a responsibility, and we as well have a responsibility to tell. We have a commission, and we ought to be about that commission. Uh, Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 9. Just a few minutes here, and we'll be done. Luke chapter 9. And I want to read a couple of verses here. Luke chapter 9, verse 1. Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of heaven and to heal the sick. And he said unto them, Take nothing for your journey, neither staves nor scrip, neither bread nor money, neither have two coats apiece. Whatsoever house ye enter into, there abide, and thence depart. And whosoever shall not receive you, then you go out in that city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the towns preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. The disciples had learned many things from Jesus Christ. He never, uh, and they were now sent out to tell others what they had learned. We never ought to stop learning and growing in our personal Christian life, and we have a responsibility to share what we're learning with others. Uh, We have the Great Commission given in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe whatsoever things I have commanded. And lo, I am with you all, even into the end of the world. Jesus Christ wanted his disciples to pass on the good news, and he wants the same thing for us. And his, his final commission ought to be our first priority. And those are the words that he left the Great Commission. The early church took this commission very seriously. I'm afraid the church today does not take it as seriously as it ought to. And, uh, and so we don't have said about us the way the disciples in Acts, uh, they were accused of turning the world upside down, literally. They, they just shook the foundations of the world at that time with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, as disciples of Christ, we have the same commission. Actually, it's more than that. It's a privilege. We ought to look at it as a privilege. Jesus said in Matthew 10, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. The word confess here means uh, literally to declare openly, to speak out freely. The word deny does, uh, is, uh, the, is, is like when Peter denied Christ. It's not really talking about uh, denying his existence, but uh, it means to disclaim Christ. And so we need to be very careful that in our lives we are faithful to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Disciples of Christ are called, sometimes criticized, but we're commissioned, and we ought to be about that business. Now, the question tonight is simple. Are you a disciple? the way that you ought to be? Are you impacting someone with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Uh, we ought to, if, if we're doing so, by the way, and we are being faithful in serving the Lord in this way, there's two distinct characteristics that will be found in our lives. Number one, rejoicing. Luke chapter 19, verse 37, And when he was come nigh, the whole multitude of the disciples began, began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. There is no joy like impacting others for Jesus Christ. It's the greatest joy in the world to help and encourage other people in Christ. So there's rejoicing. There's also fruit bearing. In, in John 15, 8, Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall be ye be my disciples. And uh, I'm just asking, I know we went over a whole lot of different things here and kind of shotgun message here, but are we a disciple? Are we a pupil? Are we learning? I'm grateful uh, to see the increasing faithfulness of our church attendance. I'm grateful to see more people coming on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. That's a blessing to see because I like to see disciples. I like to see pupils. I like to see learners. And we always ought to be a uh, pupil of the Lord Jesus Christ, a disciple. Let's be about the business of doing what he has commissioned us to do. And here it is, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. That is our impact, our impact that we make, that we want to make, 
is to spread the gospel uh, to uh, those around us, to make an impact with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have a, a man in our church call me last week, and he said, Pastor, you've been talking about making an impact. How do I make an impact personally? And I was able to help him kind of figure out some different areas that he can do specifically. And I'm grateful for that. I'm glad people are thinking that way. How can I personally make an impact? We ought to be doing that, be about the business. And by the way, you, uh, you become a disciple. You be faithful. The Lord will open those doors for you, I promise you. We thank you, Father, for loving us. And we thank you for choosing us, commissioning us. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to not be so scared of criticism or failure that we would uh, deflect ourselves from the commission that you have for us. Help us to be faithful. And even in little areas, help us to be faithful so that you can trust us in bigger areas. And we just ask you to take this message, apply it to our hearts, Lord. Help us to make a difference, make an impact. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.